my name is Harrison from Kids Call It. Um, uh, this is for all of you guys. Um, so the BFG is like, he's, he's massive. Um, so are the rest of the giants. But um, <laughs> if you were to be like, as in humans are seen as like tiny, but if you were to be either like really, really tall at the BFG or kind of small, like really small, which one would you be and which one do you reckon would like super lifestyle? <laughs> 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 That's a great question. Oh I think I would probably be, um, I think I'd probably be small because then you can see more things. Whereas if you're really, really big, you can't see things as with as much detail and with as much kind of that sort of thing. So I'd probably be smaller. Okay. And, uh, and Mark? I, I'm not that tall myself, so I'd enjoy being tall, <laughs> I think. I think I'd go for it. I mean, really tall, though. Uh, I know that you can get kicked, and it's, you're always bending your neck down to look at people. It's hard. But um, most of the tall people I know are very gentle and funny people. Uh, think of John Cleese. and there's a, I, I've, All the tall people I've known have been very, very funny, gentle people. Uh, Stephen? Well, I, I, I would, you know, certainly like to my choice would be to be small huh. uh, because uh, if you're small, you can sometimes not be noticed and get away with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, I, and Re yeah. I agree yeah. with I Steve. Agree. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lots of small people. Uh, yes, please, here in the front row. Thank you, Kim. Good question. There's a question for Stephen. Mm. You've had an incredible career. Um, I'm wondering how proud you are of your legacy and what you think the key to your success has been. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm just proud that I've been able to, you know, stay interested in making movies all these years. Uh, I met a lot of, I've met, I've met a lot of my heroes as I came through up, up the ranks of being a film director. I met, you know, John Ford when I was very, very young. I met Frank Capra. After he saw E.T., we had a meeting because he liked the movie, and so he took me to lunch. And I met a lot of my heroes over the years, David Lean and Kurosawa. And, and I've, I've seen the one thing that happens uh, uh, when directors get older is, is they, you know, they still have the passion, and they still have the, the determination to tell stories. But because of their age, uh, the, the, the people who do the hiring uh, uh, look at you as a relic from the past. And, uh, and one of the reasons I tried to DreamWorks back in 1994 was I said, I am not going to be the relic of, of the past. <laughs> you know, if I have to hire myself, and if I have to form a studio to keep myself working, by gosh, that's exactly what I'm going to do. You know, uh, so I'm just really happy that I get to keep working. I'm in, I'm in my 70th year, I guess, and, 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 um, and you know, I feel like... I, I, I don't get tired. I should. I don't. I, I love. I love what I do. I love telling stories and, ma and making movies and working with great, great actors. And so this is something you know that, you know, gets me not so much to look at myself, uh, in, in with with the word legacy, because I'm so busy now. I'm so busy looking ahead. I, I get a chance to look back sometimes when I'm when I'm being interviewed and we, we're talking movies, but I don't do it often. And so um, I don't really have a chance to look back and say. You know, I know the movies I've made and I know the impact it's had on people because I talk to strangers every day all around the world about some of those movies. And I'm really proud of the way people have grown up with a lot of those films. Um, but I just tend to think that if I dwell too much on that, you know, it's going to make me sit back on my tush and I'm not ready to do that. <laughs> so you're not going to tell me you've got a favorite of your films then? No, 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 no. I, I, no. That, that's, that's the toughest question to answer. And, and the, the cliche answer is the, the true answer because cliche and truth go hand in hand. I have seven children. You know, I have no favorites. They're all my favorites. <laughs> I would love to hear the conversation when you try and when you hire yourself. Uh, yeah, you like to do the job? Or yes, fire I'm myself. <laughs> of course, it'll never come to that. Uh, yes, please. Um, I don't think you touched on it at the beginning about um, the Bell Bell uh, Centenary Festival and, and going into schools. And I wonder if anyone on the panel um, wants to comment about the future of books and whether they actually worry about um, children's books uh, with so many distractions now. I mean, people are running around trying to get Pokemon. Do you worry that in 100 years' time we won't be celebrating the authors of today? 
I'm hoping we will. I mean, I noticed that when they had the Harry Potter books, they, the, the children were queuing outside the bookshops to read the Harry Potter books before the films came out. And um, I think reading is, is in schools. I mean, schools are doing a lot for... Because actually, the word is is everything, because a child's imagination... It's much better to have your own imagination first, and then you can have other people's imagination. But if it's always second-hand, it's not that interesting. And children should be allowed to make up their own pictures. <clears throat> and I'm hoping that that will... I don't think it's just hope. I think that it truly... They say that actually e-books are going out and that people are going back to bookshops more now. So I, I think the signs are hopeful. And uh, actually, it's always with you. The thing that you have by yourself, which is a book, and you can pick it up and put it down, you can go back over it, is something that's very unique. And I think it has a life. That's beautiful. Absolutely. Uh, yes, please, here in the front row. And then we're going to go to the third row. Hi, everyone. Uh, congratulations on the film. Um, questions to Mr. Spielberg. Uh, Roald Dahl is obviously a genius of the literary medium, and you are often consistently rightly hailed as a genius of the cinematic medium. I'm curious, with decades of brilliant work behind you and hopefully many decades ahead of you, what for you is the essence of being a director? What does it mean to be a good director? That's a great question. Um, and if I really do the answer to that question, I, I, you know, I, a lot of new directors would be able to get jobs tomorrow. Um, <laughs> you know, it, I can only speak for I can only speak for myself, really. Um, uh, I, I just I, I like being able to. I'm a very conservative director. I have a lot of um, I have a lot of sort of uh, ambition uh, about my um, my predecessors. All the geniuses that all of us, whether we know it or not, are learning from and upon whose shoulders we stand. And so I do a lot of looking back and a lot of, you know, understanding what makes a good story. Uh, the way Hollywood used to tell good stories, starting with silent movies, when, when there, was, there were just a few subtitles to help you from time to time, where, where the visual arts were explosive. And, and, and very direct and really led you to an emotional reaction and a huge climactic ending without any words at all. And then how when films first found their voice, they all sounded like plays until Howard Hawks decided to make everybody talk faster and throw in a couple of fantastic graphic visuals and start to use composition. So my, my whole love for this media comes from paying attention to the past and respecting all the movies that have been made over all of these, these years. And that's what I say to film students when they say, how do I get a job? And I say, well, it's easy to get a job if you write, because if they buy your script, buy enough of your scripts, you can insist on directing them. Or you can just take your, your device and go out and make a little movie. Anybody can do that today. Um, but, but I also say, you need to look at the old films. You know, I ha used to have to pay my kids $10 to watch a black and white movie. <laughs> I actually bribed them. If you watch this movie, and, and, they were, and $10 is a lot of money when they're 12 years old. If you watch Red River with me, I'll give you $10. And I had a couple of my kids start the movie, and 20 minutes later, give me my $10 back and leave the room. <laughs> it's, not easy, it's not easy to get us all to look back. <laughs> but, but I continue to learn, not just from the, from, the, from the films I'm seeing today. I continue to learn from the films that were made 70, 80 years ago. Uh, we have time for just one last question, and this is gentleman in the front row, who was originally meant to have the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Uh, question for Stephen. Um, you've been making films now for more than 40 years. Um, in your career, what to you has been the biggest change in how films are made? Well, I think the biggest change in how films are made today is that uh, before the digital revolution, um, you needed to use your imagination to be able to craft an illusion that the audience would accept as real. Even a movie like the original George Powell, War of the Worlds, where you clearly see all the wires on the flying machines, uh, you were, the audiences then were able to see the wires but not include the wires to help spoil the illusion 
they forgot the wires and they were terrified when the aliens were invading America in that, in that you know, early 50s color movie. Um, with the digital revolution today, there is no limit to anyone's imagination. You can literally put anything on the screen, whereas it took a lot of imagination to figure out how to craft an illusion. So illusion is gone. We no longer have to use practical magic to make you believe something is real because through digital effects, it's real and it's photo real. I mean, hopefully the success of, 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 of BFG for me is measured not just by the am amount of heart that is expressed by these two characters in their relationship, but also by the fact that hopefully 15, 20 minutes into the movie, you forget there are any effects at all. If the movie's working, you forget we use special effects to make it mark 25 feet tall and to keep Ruby in every scene with him in her four foot range. And so that's the biggest change I think that's happened. And there's pluses and minuses to that too. Uh, on that note, that's all the time we have. I'm afraid. Thank you so much for your questions. Thank you for so much for coming. Thank you and very thanks, much. Thanks, of course, Mark Rylance, Ruby Barnhill, Steven Spielberg, Rebecca Hall, and Penelope Wilton. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys. Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey!